Radio for the Masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right. Good evening, everyone. How you doing? And there you go. I'm right here. How you doing? Fade to Black. Kicking off another week. It is Monday, March 4th, 2024. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Very excited, not only about our show tonight, but the week ahead here on Fade to Black. Tonight, with John Russell is with us, and I've been been a fan of John's work for a very long time. Finally have him on the show tonight. So uh, that that's kicking off the week that we have in front of us. Tonight, John Russell is here. Tomorrow night, Hugh Newman is with us. Wednesday night, we have Dr. Heather Lynn. And then Thursday night, Brigitte Barclay. I, I mean, we have got an amazing week coming up here on Fade to Black. And you can help support what we do in and around here with our team and everything that we do. We're always improving and working. I've got writers. I have social media, the, the news, the production, everything that we do. Help us by just getting a Fade to Black t-shirt. It's very simple to do. We have two t-shirts, two ways to get them. The links are below and uh, become a Fade or Not. And part of that hard work is uh, is running right now. We added, uh, re-added, I should say, the chat room to the show. It's for Fade or Nots only, right? And so over at JimmyChurchRadio.com, the chat is right next to, well, you're looking at me here. And so which way would I point? I think I point that way to the chat. I got a point opposite of what I see on the screen. And the chat room is there. It's for fader knots only. Maybe just become a fader knot. Head over to JimmyChurchRadio.com. There are four fader knot way. There are four fader knots that you can become, and they're all right there. Okay, so uh, become a member. The chat room is always live. It's always live, so you can go and hang out with other fader knots twenty four hours a day. You just go to the members area when you when you get your membership and uh, uh, click on Bunker Cam. And that'll take you right there. It's listed under Bunker Cam. Maybe we'll change that. But uh, right now, click on Bunker Cam because that was always the live video feed, right? Uh, and that's where the chat room is sitting. So uh, you click on that, and it'll take you straight into the chat room. Very, And that is, we're always improving, all right? Okay, now, uh, before we get started, I mentioned uh, in the chat, uh, it happened earlier today, took me completely by surprise. Um, I got nominated for Best Television Host today for the uh, the Conscious Awards that are going down in Miami uh, later on this year. And uh, for, for Best TV Host, there are a lot of great, 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 great television shows out there. And this is voted on, the nominations come from the public. And that's it, right? And so you have all those TV shows, top five nominations. And I, 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 I'm i just blown away I, to, to hear it. I watched the announcement live. It's like, what? So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's an honor and a privilege. I, I it's just... I, it's just one of those things where, you know, how did I get here? How, how, how did this happen? But um, it's, uh, it's really cool. So now, you know what? Uh, let's, let's see if we can take this thing home. All right. I, I popped up. <laughs> this, all, 
brand new to me. Uh, you can vote now. I've got it up in the chat, the link where you can go and vote for, for all of the nominations and all the different categories and, you know, best podcast host, best author and, and, and everything else. Um, that is here. Archaeologists, philanthropists, space anomaly hunters, health and wellness, um, spiritual leaders. So all of the categories are there and you can just scroll down and there it is right there, television host. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the link is there. And at some point I'll pop it up in social media uh, for everybody to go and vote for, for every category. Okay. Let's get this rolling. Tonight, John Russell is with us. And I've called this show, and I know, listen, I know what you guys are thinking. All right, Russell rides, church rides. Tonight they're going to talk bikes all night long. Well, yeah. Well, not right. We, we, we got the bike talk out of the way already. But we're going to have some bike talk. The show tonight is uh, titled after one of his books. It's called Writing with Ghosts. He has had over 1,000 paranormal manifestations that he and other witnesses have experienced, including many with UFOs. And so we're going to discuss all of that. He has been a professional psychic for 50 years. He's internationally known and he has published uh, he has won many awards. Uh, he has done both nonfiction and uh, uh, three multi-award winning books that are currently in print. And that is, of course, the just mentioned Writing with Ghost, uh, his book Angels, and of course, Spirits of the Dead and A Knock in the Attic. A third book, 20 Ways to Increase Your Psychic Abilities, was published last year. And he's got a new book coming out in 2024 called The Crying Tree and the Magic rock and we'll maybe get a publication date out of him tonight uh, his websites are below on social media and over on our website and i would like to welcome for the first time to fade to black john russell there he is right there my man jimmy it's so awesome to be here man i appreciate it i've been looking forward to this uh we're gonna have a blast tonight i hope all the listeners do too yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, you know, somebody pinch me. I'm, I'm so, so, so happy that you're here. But oh, bless your heart, thank you. You get the first time guest disclaimer, and you're a psychic, and you knew this was coming, so there's no excuse. But, um, John, the disclaimer is: it's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends, and where that conversation starts, it starts; where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. There you you have to, you have to accept. You have to click. Absolutely. Okay, good, good, good. Moving on. Moving on. Uh, where do, you know, with with somebody like yourself, where I know that I can go in any direction, mm-hmm. um, there is always the common host question, what happened? Did you have a crazy uncle? Uh, was where did it begin? childhood? <laughs> yeah, where did it all begin? And but for you, uh, it was probably so long ago. It was before electricity. So yeah, can, does man. your does your memory go back that far? It <laughs> actually does, Jimmy. It, it actually does. You know, I turned seventy this month. Yeah, I saw that. I yeah. saw that. Well, happy, happy, happy birthday, brother! Thank happy you, birthday! Thank you. So I've I've been around this gig for a while. And my origin story begins when I was five years old and I was, uh, was lying in bed, sound asleep. And it was the middle of the night. And all of a sudden I woke up totally, completely wide awake, no drowsiness, no grogginess. And I thought, well, maybe there was a noise outside, a loud noise that woke me up or something. I laid there and listened, didn't hear anything. And my parents had left a nightlight on down the hall outside of my bedroom. So if I had to get up, go to the bathroom at night or whatever I could see. And so I laid there a little bit and I thought, well, this is really strange. It's just, it just feels odd. And I raised up on my elbows in bed and I looked around my bedroom and I looked out my open door into the hallway and down the hallway in the nightlights glow, I could see this elderly black gentleman peering around the doorway, looking down the hallway into my bedroom. 
And I screamed bloody murder because my family's white. We didn't have anyone. I don't even think we had black friends at that time. And no one black living with us, of course. So to a five-year-old boy, someone unknown is broken into the house. That was my thought. That was my fear. Because he was every bit as solid as you or I. He wasn't translucent, wasn't transparent, wasn't wispy. He was totally, completely solid. And when I screamed, he walked around the doorway into the hall, started walking toward my bed, started walking into my bedroom. And I can I knew he was elderly because he had close cropped white hair and he had a white mustache. And he had on, I can describe his clothes, he had on this red long-sleeved flannel shirt, plaid flannel shirt, uh, black belt, black shoes, and khaki pants. And literally every bit as solid as you or I am heading straight for me. And I scream bloody murder again. My parents come running and he stopped and he began to vanish, beginning at his feet, going up to his head. He got translucent, then he got transparent, and then he vanished. He was gone. My parents came in, turned on the light. And uh, I said, there's somebody in this house. There's somebody in this house, even though I'd just seen him vanish. And my mother was trying to console me and she was telling me, no, no, you just had a nightmare. Or something you watched on TV, it gave you nightmares. I said, no, there's somebody in this house. And I was so convincing in my fright that my father went and checked all the doors and windows, actually looked under the beds, looked in the closets. And of course, nobody was there in the flesh. And so they're trying to get me to go back to sleep. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Why did this ghost come? Is he going to come back again? Is he going to want to talk to me? Is he going to want me to do something weird or strange or scary? And so they're trying to get me back to sleep. They leave the light on. Out of exhaustion, I eventually go back to sleep. And for the next several weeks, I'm looking over my shoulder all the time because where is this guy? He came out of nowhere. He can come back again. What's happening? What's going on? And I couldn't articulate it being like five years old, right? But intuitively, this knowing, this understanding came to me. And it was like, ah, okay, this guy didn't come to hurt me. He didn't come to scare me. He came to open up the portal to these experiences that I subsequently started to have. And these were paranormal experiences that were occurring, Jimmy, on the physical realm. Not things that I dreamed or meditated or envisioned or daydreamed or whatever. These were physical experiences that actually began to occur. My parents witnessed them. Other people witnessed them. And I understood that he came to open up that portal. And then I understood intuitively that somehow, for some reason, these experiences were going to be super important to me in my life. And down the road, they were going to be super important to other people as well. And so I began to embrace those experiences. When I did, in all the years that I've had these experiences, and I've had way over a thousand now, way, way, way over a thousand paranormal manifestations. I've never again been scared, never again been afraid of anything, ever uh, been startled because if you're in your house by yourself, you know, you're alone, the doors and windows are all locked and you turn around, somebody's standing there and then they, that's, that's startling. And then they disappear and you go, oh, okay. So I've been startled, but I've never been scared again. I've never been afraid again. So I begin to piece that together and I begin to put that together and the experiences begin to intensify. And then that also kicked in my psychic gift. And I think it was a component of his appearing and opening up this portal. And the way I became aware of that was I was going on, I guess about getting close to six years old at that time. And I was out in the backyard and I was playing with a toy goofing around out in the yard and this car pulled in the driveway that I didn't recognize. And I ran inside and I got my parents. I said, hey, somebody's in the driveway. I don't know who it is. And I said, okay, we'll come look. So they came out and said, oh, these are friends of ours. And I'd never met the people. I didn't know them. So I'm goofing around with my toy and they got out of their car and they're standing on the sidewalk talking with my mom and dad before they went in the house. And they were all just standing there having a casual conversation. And I wandered over and I walked up and I just stood there and I was looking up at everybody. And there was a lull in the conversation. And I said, you folks have just been on vacation. And I said, you took that car, you drove that car that's sitting in the driveway. And I said, you have two kids and you took those kids with you. They're not with you today, but you've got two kids and you took them with how, you. The how, how, uh, John, 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 yeah. how old were you when about this happened? Six. About six. six. Okay. About okay. Three. Continue. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm painting the picture. There you okay. Go. So I'm, I'm about six years old, right? And I'm telling him this. And I said, and you took the two kids in the car. And I said, you stayed at this hotel and it had this many floors 
and it looked like this in front. It was painted this color, and there were these trees that were planted at regular intervals, and they looked like this, and around back was a pool area, and it was painted this color. Well, the lady's husband was kind of looking at me and her and my parents like, what? And she was looking at me literally, Jimmy, like I had cobras coming out of my ears. I mean, she was bug-eyed, slack jawed right. And the, she looked at my parents and she said, how the hell could he possibly know this? And my mom was all taken aback. And she's like, well, you know, kids and their imaginations. And she goes, no, no, no. This is not kids and their imaginations. How the hell could he possibly know this? And my parents didn't quite know what to say. And, and the lady said, this is what we were coming to tell you. We just went on vacation. That's what we were coming to tell you is about the vacation. We drove our car. We took our two kids. The hotel we stayed at was exactly like John described. How the hell could he possibly know that? And, and how, daughter, okay, uh, yeah. help me understand, were you uh, at the time, well, now you understand more, but right. then right. Uh, was it just like a, picture was it a movie something flow through your head and you just repeated what you were how did it come to you it, it came to me as kind of a, a moving picture in my head it came to me as still pictures it came to me as a knowing it came to me as an intuition it came to me as a certainty kind of all at once and kind of sequentially and uh, and i just i just knew it it just it just made sense and um, so and I, you I, blurted it. You blurted it out as a six year old yeah. as as fact. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like and you they, just, and they, you just and, and they validated it. You know, they validated wow. everything. Yeah. And it scared the hell out of them. I mean, they never came to visit my parents. No, <laughs> no, can't blame them. Can't blame them. Can't blame them. So, that that Russell kid down the street. That Russell kid, he's weird, man. <laughs> <laughs> So wow. that was wow. when I discovered that my psychic gift had activated as a component of the old black man's visit and this, the portal to the, the paranormal experiences occurring. And so that began to develop and I began to not only know where people had been, what they had done, what they were thinking, what their emotional state was. I began to be able to accurately predict their futures. Can we, can we back up for a second? Sure. Sure. Let's go back to uh, when you were five, the, the first night with, yeah. with the old dude that came in. Right. Um, when your parents, uh, now I'm a parent and we, mm -hmm. and, and, and this is an all too familiar story, right? Right. So how did your parents first deal with it? Your dad's going to go through the house. Yeah. He's he's looking for an intruder. You got that exactly. part. Doesn't exactly. find anybody. Right. Uh, were they were they with you? Were they believing you, or did they try to change your mind? No, because the uh, after that the paranormal experiences started happening in the house, and both my parents witnessed them. Now my mother was a believer, and on her side of the family there was a lot of experiences with the paranormal. And, uh, and she was a staunch believer and she'd had experiences. So for her, it was just like, oh yeah, okay, kind of normal deal. Now my father was, I call him a closet believer. Uh, he was entrenched in the church. And of course, if you acknowledged anything paranormal, that would bring the wrath of the church down on you, right? So he, he didn't want to talk about things. He didn't want to uh, engender that controversy and, and have to endure that. And also, now my father was a rough and tumble guy. He was a rancher. We had a stock farm before he sold that, and we bought a bar. And he was the bouncer for the bar. He kept a blackjack and a hammer behind the counter of the bar, and he was the bouncer for his own bar. So we're talking rough guy. We're talking tough guy, right? And so he could handle himself physically, but he couldn't handle the paranormal because it came and went at will. Sometimes it was invisible, but it made physical manifestations. He couldn't fight it. He couldn't grasp it. He couldn't lay his hands on it, couldn't control it. So that scared him to death. So he had to acknowledge the reality of the, the experiences that we were having in the home, but he didn't want anything to do with it. Yeah, it makes sense. 
Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, yeah, the, it, we'll we'll continue that part of the conversation yeah. uh, in 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 just a bit. That makes a lot of sense to me. And again, it sounds very typical, probably, of what children and their parents go through. As, yeah. as you know, everybody's just a little bit different. Exactly. Um, exactly. Now, what what is interesting to me is how you were comfortable with it after the the first night after that yeah. you yeah. you weren't scared i'm telling you mm-hmm. i'm i'm 60 years old mm-hmm. i'm a grown ass man <laughs> i i turn on the lights before i go into i will not go into a dark room yeah. I, 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 and i and i have this uh, it's going to happen eventually Mm-hmm. I'm I'm going to go in and I'm going to turn on the lights and something's going to be standing there. Exactly. I haven't had that. Exactly. I haven't had it yet. It will. I mean, I, it I, will. Yeah. Man, it, it's, 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 thanks, John. <laughs> I, 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 know, I know this though, you know, and, and uh, I think that we all have that, uh, that fear yeah. And the the adrenaline rush exactly. and everything else exactly. that comes along with it. Sometimes it's fun, sometimes yeah. not so fun, yeah. right? Well, you know, and that's the thing. We have a fear of the unknown. And when we have a paranormal experience, we have a knee-jerk reaction. And that knee-jerk reaction is usually because of our religious upbringing that teaches us that anything paranormal is malevolent, demonic, satanic, whatever. And it's not. And there's a plethora of teachings out there that lead people to have fear of the paranormal and fear of the unknown. And over the years, it amazes me how many people think that the, like the exorcist movie is true. That's the way it really is. Or horror movies are true. And that's the way it really is or whatever. And it's not the, um, you know, now listen, obviously if you're alone in your house or you enter the dark room, you turn on the light, somebody's standing there, that's going to start you. That may scare you. But what I have uh, striven to do, strove to do my entire life, is to take away that fear of the unknown, to take away that fear of the paranormal, and to tell people, look, this is a natural um, occurrence, a natural environment of the world in which we live. And not only are we constantly surrounded by our deceased loved ones, we're surrounded by guardian angels. We're surrounded by spirit guides. We're surrounded by nature spirits and they're there all the time. It's just that sometimes those conditions become right or our receptivity becomes right for us to perceive them and for us to interact with them. And my main goal is to explain to people, look, they're not there to hurt you. They're not there to harm you. Yeah, it's startling if it occurs, but they're not there to hurt you. They're not there to harm you. And here's ways to connect with that dimension and um, make your life better. I I tell people how to connect with their guardian angels, for example, and things like that. And I'll I'll tell you a funny story that, that kind of illustrates what we're talking about here and the fear that's associated with the other side. When I was shooting the uh, TV pilot for the history channel, uh, we were at a, at a location one night and this lady said, uh, when you get a break in the filming, I have to talk to you. This ghost tried to kill me. I was like, Oh God. I said, no ghost tried to kill me. She said, yeah, yeah. This ghost tried to kill me. So I tuned in psychically. I already knew what was going on. So went back to the the filming and then got the break and got her said, here, let's, let's go off in a room where it's private and we'll talk. So we go back there and I said, okay, tell me what happened. She said, I'm in my kitchen. She said, the cupboard door flies open by itself. This dish flies off the shelf by itself, sails across the room, smacks into the wall right beside me, shatters into a jillion pieces, falls to the floor. This ghost tried to kill me. I said, no, the ghost didn't try to kill you. The ghost didn't even try and hurt you. If he did, he would have hit you with a plate. I said, what I perceived when you told me this, and I tuned into this, was that you have been... The, the other side has been trying to contact you for a long time. There are things they need to get through to you. They want you to know. They want you to, they, to guide you, to help you, to protect you. And you've been ignoring it and pushing it away, right? She goes, yeah. I said, okay, imagine this. You're out shopping for dresses with your six-year-old boy, your six-year-old son. The worst thing a six-year-old kid can do, go dress shopping with his mama. 
So he's bored and he wants to get your attention. He's, hey, mama, hey, mama, hey, mama. And you're looking at the right. sale rack here with the dresses. Hey, mama, hey, mama. And you're not paying him attention. So he looks around. There's a chair there. And he knocks that chair over. Boom. And I, boom, you snap around. You're like, what are you doing? He's got your attention. So I said, it's the same thing with the other side. They've tried subtle things. And now you've ignored all these subtle things. So they're going to knock the chair over. They're going to do something that is like, ignore this. You're not going to be able to ignore this. Pay attention to us. And so she's like, okay, that makes sense for me. And I told her what to do, how to connect with the other side, how to connect with this guidance so that she could get this input in her life that she needed, that the other side was trying to convey to her. And we have to understand that a lot of times when these, uh, entities or when our deceased loved ones or, or whomever, whatever, come to appear to us or to communicate with us, it's to get something through to us that's important for us and that will help us and that will bless us. Um, I, we talked about motorcycles before. Here's a, here's a motorcycle story. I have to interject, though, because it's relevant to our, our conversation here. Over sure. the years, I've learned to listen to my guardian angels, and they speak audibly in my head to me. And I was riding one day on one of the interstates here in Florida and I'm cruising along about 70 miles an hour. And that's all I want to do. And I have good high speed riding skills, but that's all I want to do. I'm geezering along. It's a beautiful day. Then I have a cloud in the sky. I've got the day off and I'm just enjoying myself and I'm enjoying the countryside. And all of a sudden this voice says move into the far left lane. And I'm like, now all of this takes a split second. It's going to take a lot longer to tell you than, than how, how long it took to actually occur. But as long as I've trusted and relied on my guys on the other side, I start arguing with them. And I'm like, you know, man, I don't, I'm going to have to bob and weave and break on, break off, shift down, up, shift, throttle on, throttle. I'm going to, have to weave through this crazy traffic that imagines they're training for the Daytona 500 over there. And I can do it, but I don't want to. I'm having a good time here. And they said, John, move into the far left lane now. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. So I'm throttle on, throttle off, up, shift, down, shift, you know, break, move, Bob Weevely, and I get over there. I'm like, okay, guys, now what was that all about? And in the lane that I was at, as soon as I got over, there was, I don't know if a car hit this guy or he hit somebody, but he spun around in that lane going over 70 miles an hour on the interstate and wound up facing the wrong way and detritus from the wreck was like blowing across the road like shrapnel i was dodging hubcaps and bits of bumper and everything else and it was like holy god if i hadn't listened to my guardian angel and obeyed what they told me i'd have been right smack in the middle of that i'd have run right straight into him no telling how many cars would have rear-ended me and i wouldn't be here to tell you this story today so now, I, yeah. it, how many people ignore that? And exactly. you almost did. Exactly. You almost did. And you I almost did. did. I almost and did. You, yeah. And you know better. And, I right? know better. <laughs> and so yeah. Yeah. people that don't know better, they hear that all the time. Yes. And and they, and they don't. And they don't. Yeah, exactly. Now, yeah. um, okay. My house, I'm not going to drone on about my haunted house. Everybody mm -hmm. knows. I, 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 my house is on it. Um, and so the other day I'm just so used to it now, sure, like sure. these shoes that I'm wearing. Yeah, baby. Right? Those, those were the ones that the ghost picked out for me today. These yep. are yep. Adidas clamshells with, yep. uh, black stripes, right? Some nice those, kicks there. Some nice kicks yeah, there. Yeah, they, yeah, they're, yeah. So, so I've got to deal with my ghost and I'm not going to bore. We, if you want to talk about it, you, we, we can later. But, um, on Sunday, uh, I had a conference call. Saturday. I'm sorry. Today's Monday, right? Today's it wasn't Monday. yesterday. It wasn't yesterday. It was Saturday. I want to be yeah. factually correct. I had a conference call um, early in the morning uh, from Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm up. It's eight o'clock in the morning. Conference call is starting at eight 30. I'm, I, you know, and I literally, you know, I had everything set up. I said, okay, man, uh, it, yep, yep, everything's good. Just going to have my coffee. I'll be in my studio here in a minute. And I right. send out the text. And so I make my coffee, 
And I come in here and I turn on the light, you know, to copy a video thing. So, right. I, and then I turn around and right here. So that's, I, I just took a picture. Now I'm going to pop this up. Mm -hmm. I want to show you this. Okay. So this is to this direction to my left from where I'm sitting. Right. Okay. This is a, a workbench. It's a Marshall amp and stuff. That's not what's important. Yeah. What is important here is this. So underneath the desk, it's right. a corner desk, right? right? Okay. Underneath here, see that? That's a yeah. lunch box. You right. see it? Right. And it's a, a lunch box that's a fender amp. Fender, right, yeah. Okay, all right. So that's sitting there. This is a a, a drill. Gotcha. Case and, and a couple of extension cords. Okay. Right. right. Nice and neat. You see how it's stacked up and this is holding up. You, you see that? Right. Okay. All right. And that's sitting underneath my desk. Gotcha. All right. Okay. Right, right there. So I'm 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 sitting here on this conference call and I spin around on my tab just talking, you know, and I'm drinking right. my coffee. Right. right. And I look down and I see this. And this is the actual picture that I took. So you see that? Right. Okay. This is the picture that I took. There you go, baby. Yep. There you go. All right. All right, all right. Now, now I'm sitting here. My house is, you know, you know when something's out of place. Anyway, sure. Sure. so I turn around and I, <laughs> I'm on a conference call. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> right? Oh no! What? <laughs> and they're like, what's going on? And so I took this picture uh, to show to everybody. Now I want you to look. This is moved too back here. The yeah. the. Uh, the Ryobi, Ryobi uh, drill, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but look, just look at that picture yeah. and and trip on that, and uh, this is how it normally. Yeah. Now now well, the lunchbox I, was turned up on its side too. Yeah yeah yeah. Uh huh. Yep, you caught that. Yep. Take a really just look. Yep. <laughs> like what? Yep. And now now. Okay, so with a situation like that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now um, I have I have the ability to uh, video yeah. in this studio. I've got yeah. one. I can show. I can show you. There's one, two, three, four, five cameras. Right, right, right in front of me. Right. I've got time lapse cameras. Right, right. I've got stands. I've got tripods. I've got anything that I would need to capture this stuff. Infrared. Yeah. I've got yeah. FLIR. I've got right. night vision. But I don't want to see it. <laughs> you, do you follow me? Now, and I understand. So when I show you something like this for right. the audience. Right. Um that's that's freaking me out when yeah. I see it, but I'm not hurt. Right, right. The lunchbox didn't fly. That I'm showing you this because of what the lady had said. Right, right. right. The lunchbox didn't fly across the room and hit me in the head. Exactly. If that happened, I've got John Russell here with holy water. Right, <laughs> we're we're, <laughs> we're going to cleanse his house, but. Do you understand uh, where I'm going with this? I, yeah, I, yeah. The phenomenon is real, but I, I don't. Real. I don't have a reason to feel uh, scared. Or, you exactly. know, like I'm, exactly. I'm going to yeah. be hurt. Yeah, because you know the other side. Um, there are occasions where you have full-bodied apparitions, like I have, and there's occasions where you have the that uh, audible voice uh, communication. But for the most part, and for whatever reason, and we don't understand all these things. Anybody that tells you they do, they're lying. Nobody understands these things fully. I've, I've investigated this since I was 11 years old, read everything on the planet, had all these experiences. I have more questions than answers. But it seems like 
that those on the other side, whether it's deceased loved ones, guardian angel, spirit guides, nature spirits, whatever, it seems like they're more easily able to, uh, to influence physical objects, to move things, to slam doors, open doors, close doors, make a rock and share a rock, whatever. And so that seems to be the preferred method of communication. Uh, it seems to be the easiest form of communication for them. And it's also the most attention getting because like you say, you turn around and go, whoa, <laughs> you know, obviously somebody has done something here to get my attention. And the, uh, the reason for these communications can be many. Uh, sometimes it's, hey, we're trying to get your attention, tune in, meditate, let us give you some, some guidance here. Uh, other times it could just be maybe a loved one saying, hey, I'm here, I love you, I'm thinking about you, just want you to know I'm here. Sometimes, and it took me a number of years to get to this, but sometimes it may just be, hey, how you doing? I'm here, and that's it. Just like you or I text and say, hey, Jimmy, how you doing? Did you ride today? Uh, no, it was raining. I didn't want to get out, put the rain gear on. All right, well, stay safe, man. Catch you later. And that's it. No big deal. No earth shattering conversation. No big, uh, you know, uh, earth changing information passed on. Just a normal, hey, you know, how's it going? And I think the other side does that with us as well sometimes. Just a, hey, you know, move the, uh, move the lunchbox, move the drill. Just want you to know we're here. Just want you to know we're keeping tabs on you. We're with you. Okay. Now that sounds all good. Yes. Okay. All right. It does. It does. And that's, yes. that's kind of the way I've been dealing with it. Yep. But you could also handle it the wrong way. Can you <laughs> aggravate the situation? Well, it's, it's not so much as aggravating the situation as misinterpreting the situation and having a wrong reaction to the situation. An example of that, I had a client that called me and, uh, said, uh, I saw this, this psychic on TV and they said, uh, if you want a ghost in your house, ask for a ghost and a ghost will show up. And so the client told me, said, Hey, this sounds like fun. I'm going to do that. And I got a ghost and it scared the crap out of me. And it did all kinds of things around the house. I told it to go away and it wouldn't. And so I moved, I literally moved trying to get rid of the ghost and the ghost followed me and where I was living, the, uh, the ghost would set off the car alarms sequentially up one side of the street and down the other. And the neighbors called the cops on me because they said, okay, this has never happened before. The only change in the variable is that this person has moved in. Now this has started. Somehow she's got to be responsible. So she said, the cops are standing on my front porch, talking to me, questioning me. And the car alarms go off in sequence up, up, up and down the street, up one side, down the other, while the cops are standing there and they look at each other and shrug and go, I don't know what the hell is going on. Don't want to know. It's obviously not her. We're out of here. So I said, okay, this is how you handle this. I said, look, if there's a dog on the street, stray dog on the street, and you here, here, come here, get in the car, get in the car. I'll take you home. And the dog's like, oh, wow, okay, I got a home. Somebody's going to take care of me. I'm going to have food and I'm going to have shelter and I'm going to have a place to stay. And then you get home, you're like, nah, I don't want the dog. You try and you throw the dog out the front door, go away, go away. So the same thing with the spirit. All spirits, whether they're nature spirits or, or whatever, they have emotion, they have intelligence, they have will, volition, understanding, just like we do. So I said, you asked for the spirit and you got it. And the spirit was like, okay, great. I've, I've got a home here. And now you're like, no, you don't go away. I'm, I'm sorry. I, you know, it's like you're insulting it basically. And I said, on top of that, you move to try and get away from it. So it follows you. And then it's like, it's upset. It's like, Oh, you know, ghost me. Will you pardon the pun? I'm going to set these car alarms off up and down the street in retribution. And so I said, here's what you do. I said, go to the spirit. I said, there's other things we can do if this doesn't work, but this will work. I said, go to the spirit and say, listen, I apologize. I'm sorry. I invited you into my home and you came and then I immediately tried to kick you out. And I apologize for that. And look, I want you to understand that this right. is new to me and I'm right. a little scared. I'm a little frightened and it's going to take some getting used to. So you're welcome here. Stay here. I did invite you, but listen, don't do too dramatic of things to me. Let's ease into this. I know you're around, but I don't need to see super weird manifestations at the start. And then I said, ask the spirit to protect you and watch over you in the house. And especially when you're gone, like 
just tell the spirit, say, hey, I got to go to the grocery store. If you're not coming with me, if you're going to stay here, watch over the house. Keep the house safe. I said, do now, that. When you said oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. That sounds like good advice. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have this personally. I have morphed into that attitude on my own. Yeah. All right. I, 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 I live alone, so I don't have somebody here to right. hold my hand or talk me through this or give me right. advice right. or let's try to figure this out together. No, I'm kind of on my own. And the other part about this is I, I've interviewed so many uh, paranormal. I've, I've done TV shows. I've, done, I've been on my ghost hunts and, right. and, and things. So I've, I've got a basic knowledge here. Yeah. Um, what what I didn't want to do and the advice that I try to give to everybody, and this is the question uh, for you, yeah. is don't freak yourself out. Exactly. Don't, don't, because if you do, I mean, I could, I could really get scared. Yeah. We all can. I mean, like, sure. like scared. Sure. Yeah. Oh, and there's so, no reason to, there's no reason to, you know, right. we've been taught that the other side is dangerous or malevolent or whatever, or this or that. And, you know, the ghost hunting shows on TV don't do us any favors because there's a demon behind every bush and everything's evil and everything's malevolent. It's not that way. You know, I've had way, 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 way over a thousand physical paranormal manifestations. I've done paranormal investigations since I was 11 years old. I've never been bitten. I've never been scratched. I've never been hit. I've never been shoved. I've never been threatened. You know, any of these things. And most of the time, I'm not saying every single instance, but in every case that I personally have been called in to investigate or to help a person with this and the other that says they have experienced something that dangerous and melodramatic, there has either been drug use involved, mental illness, alcohol use, or just a total, complete misunderstanding, misrepresentation of what went on, or outright lies. And, um, you know, it's, it's very easy to misinterpret things. So, you know, when I do paranormal investigations, I go in with okay, you said you experienced this. Let's see if we can find the reason for that. Let's see if we can recreate it. Let's see if we can understand why you say you experienced this. And again, I've never experienced anything that I felt was malevolent okay. or whatever. Is it because, and I'm not saying this to be funny. Sure. Is it because they know that you can't be scared? Right, you know, but that, somebody, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, somebody else that is susceptible to it. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know that, that can be it. a part of it. And look, we do have to understand one thing: if your uncle was a horrible prankster and a practical practical jokester and left us scare the living daylights out of you, he's going to be the same on the other side. Why not? You know, and <laughs> and likewise. There are nature spirits, there are other entities, there are other beings that were not human, were not ever human, but they have, in essence, a, a sense of humor, a, a sense of joking or pranksterism or whatever. And it's like, if you know somebody, uh, this, this is a common thing with people that have cats, and you know somebody hates cats. When they come over to visit, the first thing you're going to do is get your cat and put it in their lap. <laughs> Here, take the cat. You know, That's what so, I would do. Yeah. yeah. And so there's, there's spirits on the other side that are kind of the same way. And uh, we have to understand that, uh, you know, some of these things may be a little frivolous or a little pranksterish or, or kind of joke with us, but it's not in a malevolent way or malevolent sense. And it's like you say, our actions and reactions determine, you know, how we're going to get along with these things. And what people need to understand, another thing I want people to, to understand and get a grasp on, you know, all you hear about lately is attachment. So I went paranormal investigating. I got an attachment. This thing followed me on. I can't get rid of this attachment. I, 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 I. Now, listen, folks, when you and me and Jimmy are sitting here tonight, wherever we're at individually and all of our listeners, wherever you're at right now, this moment, there are radio waves going through the air that we don't see, but they're there. 
And if you get a radio and you plug it in the wall and you turn the dial and you go, oh, here's a rock station. Here's rock music in the air. Oh, here's a jazz station. Oh, here's a country station. That music is going through the air 24 hours a day. It's all around us all the time. We're just not aware of it. Okay. The same thing with spirits. Everywhere we sit right now, around you are your deceased loved ones, your guardian angels, your spirit guides, nature spirits, other spirits that have as much right and access to these dimensions as we do. Guess what? They're there. You didn't get something, bring it home. It's it's there all the time anyways. Now, granted, some spirits do want to come with you. I was at a state park one time here. And, you know, the, the Indian heritage is, is especially rich here in Florida. And this spirit presented himself to me as a young Native American. And he said, hey, I want to go home with you. I said, hop on the bike and let's go. Let's, let's go home. You can come on. So he would manifest by, we had the house we lived in at the time. We had a garage and then coming into the garage, there was a door into the house, which was the laundry room. He went through the laundry room. There was another door that led into the hallway of the main house then. And so the way that he would manifest, make his presence known, is he would rattle the laundry room door while we were sitting there at night watching TV. Now the garage door is down, all the doors are locked coming into the house, the alarm's on, and he would grab this door and rattle it so hard that my wife would go, I know it's just a ghost, but would you go check? <laughs> and of course it was him. And sometimes when we were coming in, I would unlock the door to come into the house, grab the knob, start to pull the door open. He would grab the knob from the other side and pull the door shut. And we would do that two or three times kind of as a joke, just, just, just fun, just, just hanging out. And so he stayed with us for a long time like that. And then he was like, Hey man, I've enjoyed it. Got to move on. Appreciate the camaraderie. Enjoy the house. And, and off he went. So just Reminds because you me have of somebody that wants to hang out with you doesn't mean it's bad, you know? Right. Right. Reminds me I, I the, the TV show <laughs> ghosts. I love that show. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, the, there's two versions. Yeah, the British version and the American. They're both great, by the way. Uh, I, I don't prefer one over the other. But it, it it shows me, the writers and creators of that show got it pretty close. Yeah. I, I, I can imagine that being real. Yeah. Like that, that's just how it is. Um, yeah. Do you know, you know, Graham Bonnet, the singer for Rainbow and, and uh, uh, Bonnet, Alcatraz, right. Uh, right. certainly. And that, that album uh, uh, down to earth with uh, Richie Blackmore, Rainbow, yeah. you know, since you've been gone, you know, all night long, those are, those are rock anthems. Those Absolutely. are Absolutely. Right. Okay. So Graham, he's a friend of mine. I've known Graham for a long time. He's yeah. on fade to black. Right. And, and he tells the story mm -hmm. about why he has short hair. Yeah. Now remember he's, he's a rock front man for the yeah. biggest band in the world. Right. Right. So yeah. what do you see? Everybody looked like Robert plant or, exactly. or Coverdale or David exactly. Lee Roth or whatever, you know, pick the band. Yeah. But, um, uh, be, one night before they played uh, Castle Donington yeah. for two hundred thousand people, right? Uh, they're headlining. He's at his London apartment, John, and he sees down the hallway. He's in the kitchen in the back. He sees in the front room, in the mirror, in his front room, all the way down the hallway, in the mirror is somebody sitting in his rocking chair yeah. in the front room. Yeah. He's like, what? And so he walks in. This is Graham Bonnet, man. Okay. <laughs> he walks down the hallway, around the corner, and in the rocking chair is James Dean. Yeah. yeah. And so he sits and talks to James Dean all night. Yeah. yeah. And he, the next day, he goes to the stylist and cuts his locks off mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like James Dean. Yep. And that's why he has the James Dean hair. Yeah. And I yeah. asked him, and I said, so wait, 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 was it a goat? Well, he said, yeah, it was a ghost, <laughs> but he was so real. Yeah. yeah. He was physical. I sat and talked to him all night in, in my front room. 
Yep. And it reminds me of you and the old black man, right? right? Where right. this was physical, this wasn't see-through. Exactly. Uh, exactly. You know, Casper the Friendly Ghost situation. This was yeah. an actual uh, physical James Dean sitting in the chair. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I have to tell you know, just I've had let's let's talk about some of these experiences I've had because they're just they're incredible. They're just just wonderful. Um, one of them, the uh, uh, one of the favorite stories that people love to hear. I had uh, I had uh, divorced and moved back into my old family home, and so had my sister. And ostensibly, we moved back in, kind of take care of my mom, who was in poor health and declining. But we both just kind of really needed a soft place to fall, so we we were both back in the old family home. And my sister had a couple of little dogs, little small dogs. And one of them was constantly sick, constantly ill. And uh, I had uh, been out and I had a big red Doberman, Elsa. And uh, she was like 100 pounds, pure muscle, one of the best dogs I have ever known, had the privilege to know my entire life. And uh, I had been out, I don't, I don't even know what I was doing. I was out walking, but um, what had happened was uh, I would, I came in one day and I, I said hi to Elsa and I walked into the house and it was just this beautiful, gorgeous day. And, uh, I just had this marvelous time and it's about the middle of the afternoon. And I went in, I said hi to mom. The little dogs were on the bed with her. My sister was at work and, uh, I went and made myself a sandwich and I sat down at the dining room table to, to eat my sandwich. And I was just sitting there just enjoying the day, thinking no thoughts in particular. And I heard the little dog jump down off the bed and come down the hallway. And so I knew he was going to go in the kitchen to either get a drink of water or get food or whatever. So I looked over my right shoulder to look through the, the hallway door. And I, oddly enough, that was where the old black man went through this, the same doorway. And so the little dog comes through and I looked over and I watched him. And he walked behind me and I turned my head the other way to see him to walk into the kitchen. And when I turned my head that way, there was this woman standing there bent down looking into my face. She was about two feet away from my face. I can tell you her, her hair color, eye color, her clothes shed on everything else. And I startled me so much. I jumped up, my chair flipped over, hit the floor and I threw my sandwich, which fortunately landed on the table. So I still got to eat my sandwich, scared the hell out of the little dog. He skittered into the kitchen and then she vanished. And, uh, my mother said, what happened? What happened? I said, oh, I just saw a ghost. Well, in our house, that was normal. So she was like, was there any message? And all of a sudden, in a split second, this woman that I had seen in spirit communicated to me that she had been following the little dog around. Now, the dog was always sickly, always going to the bed, always had all these health problems. And she communicated to me that she had been following the little dog around because he was going to cross over within a couple of weeks time. And she was going to be there to cross him over so he wouldn't cross over by himself. And I was like, oh, my God, that's wonderful. That's awesome. But I said, I can't tell my mother and my sister that it'll break their hearts. I just said, no, no, no message, just saw the ghost. So sure enough, a couple of weeks later, the little dog died in his sleep. And uh, he had this uh, this big squeaky green frog toy that he that he loved. And it was all dirty and messed up and gnarled and mangled. And and he loved that. And he had this uh, this robe from my sister that he would wrap up his toys in and lay on and sleep and all this kind of stuff. So we always buried our animals in the yard. A lot of people do. And my sister got the little dog. She said, well, I'm gonna wrap him up in the robe. We'll bury him in that. And we'll put his frog toy in with him. So the little dog's small. He's, he's about, you know, maybe two feet long, maybe, maybe a foot high, if that much, little small dog. So it takes lots of folding and lots of wraps and turns of this blanket to our, this robe to use it all up to, to wrap up the dog. And she puts the frog toy in there, wraps it up in all the folds and everything. So now you've got this little small solid package of this robe that the dog's in with the frog toy and everything. So we dig a hole in the backyard and uh, we, we bury him and we cover it over. And I put this, this large rock that we had over the, uh, over the grave site so that no animals would dig him up or anything. So enough time had gone by that the earth had solidified, all the grass had grown back over the grave. If you didn't know where he was buried, you would never know there was a grave there. The lawn was perfect. Everything was solid. So, and I'd moved the rock away. 
So I, again, I was out one day walking, doing something. I came back in, went by the pen where my, my door room was, stopped and said hi to her. I was walking up the driveway and something, another beautiful, bright, sunny day. And I look over and in the green lawn, something catches my eye. And I look over and I'm like, what in the world is that sitting in the yard? And I walk over and I get closer and it's sitting on top of the little dog's grave. And as I get closer, it's that little green frog toy. No, stop. Don't, don't. Yes. Take, really? Yes. I, I, I knew yes. you were going to say that. So I, mean, I go over. Oh, 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 okay. Keep I, going. Keep going. I kneel down and I pull on the grass and the dirt to see if the grave has been disturbed or whatever. It's totally solid. Totally great. I pick up the frog. I look at it. It is that frog toy. And I said, okay, either the little dog or through the combination of the agency of spirit and the little dog. He said, hey, I'm here. I made it. I'm okay. I remember you guys. I love you guys. And so I took the frog and I set it on the steps to the apartment that was attached to our house where my sister lived. And I went in and told my mom what happened. And we waited for my sister. So my sister came home. I hear the car stop in the driveway. I hear the engine turn off. No door opens and closes. And it sits there for a long time. My mom says, why isn't she coming in? I said, I know why she's not coming in. She sees that frog on those steps and she's freaking out, wondering if she's hallucinating. So finally she gets out of the car, comes in. I hear her come running through the house, uh, through the apartment into the house. She goes, did you see this? Where did this come from? And I told her the story. She went out, got down on her hands and knees, checked the grave, everything solid, everything smooth. So they, they can and will come back and communicate with us from the other side. Now, the most dramatic example of that. Even well, well, dramatic, wait, 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 yeah, wait, yeah, wait, yeah. wait. You can't <laughs> tell that story and just move on. Uh, okay. Uh, we're we're going to hit a break here in, okay. in, in about 60 seconds. But okay. before we get there, what'd you do with the frog? Did you rebury it? Elsa. Did you it keep it? No, I kept it, gave it to Elsa Mondoverman. She played with it till she tore it up. And, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, there's an even greater one when we come back from the break. Well, you know, so what does that ultimately, you know, like, you know, my lunchbox over yep. here or, or, or the shoes and, and stuff. Ultimately, what does that tell you? Because the ability to go physical and move stuff, the frog is, you know, that, that, that's a, right? That's an object. Yeah. The lunchbox is an object. These right. are things where they are physically being moved. Yeah. So what does that tell you and how do you think it's able to happen? Well, you know, telekinesis has been well known for many years and the other side is obviously able to exercise that, uh, you know, to, to move that frog, out of several wrappings of that robe and up through several feet of dirt to the top, that's, that's pretty heady. And, uh, you know, you look at those things and, and it's the other side saying, Hey, you know, this is real. We can communicate with you. We can do things. And then the purpose of that is to get us to attune more with that realm so that we learn and believe there's life after death, life continues. There are things that we can learn from the other side to help ourselves, to help others, to live a better life and to work for peace in this world, to work for healing in this world. That's one of the main messages that I get over and over and over. The, <laughs> the, the, the part where science, and I talk about this nearly on every show, mm -hmm. science and physics and the quantum world, quantum right. computers, right. the way that they operate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. proves the existence of a parallel world in the afterlife. Oh, I don't care what it, yeah. I don't care what anybody says. It, the fact absolutely. that a quantum computer operates yeah. the way that it does yep. says everything else yeah. is just what you think it is. It says it's, it's not crazy talk. Let's exactly. take our break right here. Our guest tonight, John Russell, Riding with Ghosts. We'll talk yeah, about that book when we come back. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black.
Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get your alerts and access to over 2,000 videos. Click that subscribe button right now. My job is not to preach. My job is to take you on this journey. In a state of passion, nothing negative can happen. That it's the moons of those planets that would have life. Sometimes I see, you know, these energies also in your field. It is our passion and our pleasure. Go to JimmyChurchRadio.com and get the Fade to Black official podcast. 2,000 episodes, all of them commercial free for just $2 a month. This is Jimmy Church. Please visit and explore Egypt this October 3rd through the 14th, 2024 with Billy, Elizabeth, myself, and very special guest and the number one podcaster in the world, Sean Kelly. It's simple to do. Just go to ForbiddenKnowledge.com and click on Upcoming Tours or click on the link below. We'll see you there. Watch Into the Vortex on Gaia TV. It's fade to black for the screen. Simple to do. Go to Gaia.com, search Jimmy Church, or click on the link below. Follow Fade to Black on Twitter at J Church Radio. Get all of the show updates every single day. It's it, it's now called X, but who cares? How you doing? Jimmy Church here. Special announcement. Get your Fade to Black t-shirts. That's right. Help support the show. Help support everything that we do over here. We've got two t-shirts. We've got two ways to get them. And right now, if you get a Game Changer membership for a limited time, you will get Fade to Black Blend Coffee with your Game Changer membership. That's right. We have two t-shirts. We have the original, the classic Fade to Black t-shirt. You know you want one. Post a picture. Send it to us. We'll put it in our Fade to Black gallery. And we've got the new official Fade to Black t-shirt drawn by Michael Oming. Two t-shirts, two ways to get them. Get yours today. Everything is in stock. Everything gets autographed. Everything includes shipping. And you're going to get a tracking number. And with a Game Changer membership, you get an email to me. You get unlimited commercial-free downloads of the show. Those are uploaded every single night after the show to the website. So don't delay. Get your Fade to Black t-shirt today. Go Backley Tappy. Go to JimmyChurchRadio.com and become a fade or not. Get a membership. That's right. Everything is commercial free. You have access to downloads and you get to call yourself a fade or not. River Moon Coffee, makers of the fade to black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black Blend, the Game Changer Blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, 
rivermoonwellness.com. All right, welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, award-winning author, researcher, paranormal, ET contact, UFO experiencer, John Russell, all of the above. He's also a writer. A writer, not yeah, a writer. Um, <laughs> did you ever find out the identity of the old black man? You know, I never have. Uh, I've, I've thrown my psychic radar out there numerous times and the best that I could come up with was he was some type of spirit guide, some type of guardian angel or whatever. And his job was to say, okay, I got to go to this kid, got to open up this portal, got to activate this gift. That's my job. Let's get her done. Now, uh, I, I just had to ask that. I had to go back and, yeah. and, and, and find out, um, how, how can, uh, 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 man, I just do, do, do tough as nails, Harley rider, biker dudes believe in ghosts. Can oh, you see, right, yeah. right, right, right. Can, can you, can you bring up this conversation? And, and I'm, I'm, we're going to talk about UFOs too, as well in this segment. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what about that part too, as well? Does it, does it, come with being a free spirit and and, you know, I think and wondering does. about the world? I think it does. I think being a free spirit and, and having a more rebellious attitude, if you will, not taking things at face value, not taking things for granted. Mm -hmm. I think it makes bikers tend to be a little more spiritual. Uh, and I think it makes bikers tend to be a little more open. And there's a lot of bikers that I've been able to share these experiences with that have acknowledged the validity of these experiences and shared their experiences with me. So I think it does. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's something about uh, being uh, on the open road. We've yeah. look, we've all heard, you know, bikers tell their story and I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I ride, but I get bored with the stories too, as well. It's like, okay, here we go. All right, all right. I, we get it, man. We get it. We, we, but but there's something that comes with that. Yeah, uh, yeah. You remember you experience the, the world in a way that you cannot experience the world in a car or in any other form of transportation. You get on that bike. You're one with the machine. You're one with the road. You're one with the wind. If you're going down the road and somebody's mowing hay or mowing the grass or whatever, you can smell it a mile away. Whereas you won't in the car, uh, you've got the wind on you. You've got the bugs on you. You've got the dirt, the rain, the sand, everything. So you become one with nature and what's happening in nature. And it's just a, it's, it's a feeling you can't achieve any other way. It, it is a spiritual experience. It is. It is. You're flying. Yeah. Yeah. You're flying. It, you it, it, that is, it's it's uh, uh, if you want to know what an eagle feels like, yep. man, hit the open road, man. That's and, it. But That's it. but uh, going back when I was a kid, uh, I, I grew up with a family that always had motorcycle. We we had you know like four or five bikes in the garage. Right. right, right. My dad had an OSA two fifty. Yeah. He had a BSA single cylinder five hundred thumper. There you um, go. I, I remember uh, kick starting that, trying to when I was like ten. Yeah, and, and it, I was, back. <laughs> dude, I, I I was thrown into my neighbor's backyard. Literally, yeah, almost yeah, broke yeah. my leg. Yeah. But but anyway, um, we we always had that right yeah. in 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 yeah. the garage. Okay, so. Uh, I get that part of it. And when I was a kid, I read uh, my dad's copy of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle yeah, Maintenance, yeah. right? Yeah. Very First famous thing, yeah. book. Yeah, very famous book in the 70s. And it's yeah. it's, it's a great read. I didn't get it. I mean, I, I did. Yeah. But but now I truly get truly it. Truly get it, yeah. In that you uh, achieve a meditative state. It is. It's That's it. Yeah. yeah, it's a zen. You are you are at one with your own head. 
Yeah. It's it's a, yeah. it's a bizarre and and that's why I got the bike. Yeah. That's you, and, become, that, you become one with the machine. There's a symbiotic relation there between you and the machine and the machine has a soul and a spirit and there's an energy there and there's a psychic and a spiritual connection there. And when you achieve that state the the world expands and ceases to exist all at the same time. It's just it's incredible. Yeah, the um, uh, there's a you're right about that. Um, I'm, I'm going to say this before we move on to UFOs. Uh, yeah. And if you ride, uh, you will understand what I'm saying. But there is a sensation you get when John's going to laugh when I say this because it's so true. When your knees touch the tank. Yeah. And you and you grab and 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 you make that vibrational connection. Yes. And you're lot. You, you know what I mean. Now you yeah. are in this gyroscopic oneness with Those and you're. Yeah. yeah, you're steering with your with your legs. Yeah. You, you know what I mean. This this yeah. thing, and we, you achieve this Zen state. Yep. And it's really weird, man. It's just it is. like it is. It, it, there is nothing else like it. You will not achieve what you experience motorcycling through any other form of spiritual practice. No, no, it's it. I, I'm so it, there. It, yeah, I'm so there. Everything that I expected, I got. And yeah. and there's and so the, much more. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, enough of the motorcycle talk. We could do that all, all night, night long. Okay, Man, I, got, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got this really cool set of bolt covers. There you go. Yeah, yep. man. Ma magnetic bolt covers. Yep. Spent like two hours. I'm literally backing up on the bike. I'm like, okay, I got 120 bolt covers here. Okay, <laughs> and you and you're walking around like, okay, I know there's another one in here somewhere. Yep. All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Enough of <laughs> bolt, <laughs> bolt covers. And, yep. and 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 you know what I ended up? Uh, so I go and I I put the and they they're beautiful bolt covers. Everybody, they're things that cover you, you cover every bolt on your bike you don't want a naked bolt on your bike so anyway so i get all of that done and then you know what i did i know what what i thought this was a thought in my head let's just replace the bolts yeah yeah let's get a <laughs> bolt set and it's just like it's never ending, man. It's just it's never, true. it's, it's true. never, yeah. never ending. I I spent all that time covering the bolts, and then I literally went. Let's now let's just get a bolt set. <laughs> <laughs> let's just pull all these. Okay, um, uh, UFOs. Yeah. Um, I live in a really cool spot. I see things. I've seen a lot of things. Yeah. Um, it's gotten to the point now uh, that I almost don't remember mm -hmm. my first experience, mm -hmm. right? I, I got to roll back. There's just, I've yeah. seen so much of it now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was your first uh, UFO and contact experience? Oh, man, it was, it was really strange, Jimmy. Um, I was, I guess, around 20. I had been uh, reading professionally for doing psychic readings professionally for uh, since I was 18. And I'd had all of these paranormal experiences and I did not believe in UFOs. I had read the, uh, the stories, read the magazines, read the books, seen the interviews, didn't buy it, didn't believe it. And uh, one afternoon, this one, I'm growing up in West Texas. And the town I was in, I knew then and still do like the back of my hand. Literally, there wasn't a place in the town you could get me lost. And that plays into the story because I knew exactly where I was during this whole this whole episode. So I had been to this place. It was about four in the afternoon. And uh, I had parked in the parking lot across the street. There's a narrow two lane street. And I came out of the building and this blast of wind hits me in the face. And I was like, oh, boy, here we go look up and it's overcast. I'm like, well, we're in for it. Cause in West Texas, you grow up, there's tornadoes, there's thunderstorms, there's softball size hail, there's all the stuff to deal with. So I'm a veteran of all of that. So I know what to expect. And uh, I said, well, I better run for my car before the rain hits because 
In Texas, it can rain hard enough in 20 minutes to flood your yard or flood underpasses or whatever. So it can, it can really come down. So I start across the street toward my car. I can see it in the parking lot there. It's a narrow two lane street. Parking lot's open. I see my car. And I stopped dead still because in the parking lot by my car, there is this collinear cloud, this column shaped cloud coming down from the clouds in the sky above that's attached to those clouds coming down and resting on the asphalt right by my car. And I look at this thing. I've seen dirt devils and dust devils. I've seen tornadoes and all this, but this is not that. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, okay, now what in the world is this? And as I'm watching this thing, it's like really, really slowly rotating and kind of undulating. And as I stand there and watch this thing, Jimmy, from within the cloud, there's these orbs that are oh, maybe soccer ball size, basketball size, and they come out of the cloud just a little ways enough to protrude from the cloud, and then they go back in. And that happens all the way up and down the length of the cloud, and they're phosphorescent, they're glowing, they're red, they're yellow, they're blue, they're orange, they're green. And I decide, in spite of all my paranormal experiences, I decide at the age of 20, something snapped, and I've gone nuts, and I'm hallucinating. And honest to God, I'm thinking this to myself, in spite of all the paranormal experiences I've had, and I decide, okay, when this clears up and I get to my car, I'm going to go to the hospital, and I'm going to say, hey, man, you got to check me out. Something's wrong here. So I'm watching this thing, and these orbs continue to go in and out of the cloud, and at, down around the bottom of the cloud, I look, and there's, like, crushed paper cups and straws and various bits of paper and debris and things. So with this thing rotating, all of that should be blowing around or moving or whatever, and it's perfectly still. None of the debris, the debris is moving. I say, okay, this makes no sense. So then I get this unreal, bizarre communication in my head, and it says, walk towards the cloud. So I'm like, okay, so I take a few steps toward the cloud, and the cloud advances toward me in the parking lot. I stop, and it stops. I back up, and it backs up. So we do this tango a few times, and I go back up, and I'm standing by the building now. I'm standing by the door. And the door opens, whacks me in the back, nearly knocks me down. This buddy of mine comes out and he goes, oh, man, sorry. He said, what are you doing standing so close to the door? And before I could even answer, he looks up and he goes, oh, boy, looks like we're in for it, huh? And then he looks in the parking lot and he goes, what in God's name is that? And I go, oh, thank God, I'm not crazy because he sees it too. It's real. And I say, watch this, watch this. I walk towards the cloud, it moves toward me. I stop, it stops. I back up, it backs up. I do that a few times. I look at him, I say, isn't that the weirdest thing you've ever seen? He looks at me like I'm the weirdest thing he's ever seen. He's like, bye, he's out of there. It scares him to death. His car's parked the other way. He runs the other way. I'm like, oh, great. So now I'm here with this thing. I know it's real. The interaction has been witnessed. What do I do now? So all of a sudden, the cloud sucks back up into the clouds above. They start to move over. And I'm like, okay, I run for the car, get in the car. I'm like, what in the hell was that? So I back out. I start down the street. I know exactly where I'm at on the street. There's angle parking on the streets. So the cars are angle parked there. And even though it's overcast, it's four in the afternoon, you can see. So it starts to rain. And Jimmy, the rain comes down so hard. You've got to understand this. I have got my windshield wipers on high. I've got my headlights on. And my visibility is about one foot past the hood of my car. That's how hard it's raining. I've never seen anything like that in my life. I look out my passenger window. I cannot see the cars that are angle parked a few feet away from me. So I start panicking. I'm like, I'm going to hit somebody. Somebody's going to hit me. I'm going to swerve into these angle parked cars. And that's how hard the rain is coming down. There is like zero visibility. I've never seen anything like this. So... I get up on the bumper of this car in front of me and almost hit it before I stop. The car behind me almost hits me. And I'm like, okay, why is this car stopped? And I see this little teeny tiny pinprick of red light about this big. And I'm like, oh my God, that's the stoplight. And that's how it appears in the rain. That's how, how hard the rain's coming down. So I know the street I'm on. There was a Sears Roebuck store there. And in the back of the Sears Roebuck store, they had an automotive center and there was this huge parking lot. 
So my plan is if I can make it to that parking lot, get in there, I'm going to park however I can, jump out, I'll be soaked to the bone, I don't care. I'm going to go in Sears, I'm going to go down to the basement, look at the sporting goods, because they have the best sporting goods store on the planet. So I said, okay, this this is my plan. If I can make it there, this is what I'm going to do, because I can't continue to drive. I'm going to wreck. Somebody's going to hit me, I'm going to hit somebody. You need so, something oh, to do. You need something to do. I get yeah, it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to poke around the corner here. I'm going to follow this car in front of me as close as I can without hitting it. Hope nobody hits me. Now, again, imagine this. There is a foot of visibility beyond the hood of my car. I don't care what kind of rain you've been in. You've never seen anything like that. You can't see beyond a foot of the hood of the car. You can't see out the side windows. You can't see the cars that are angle parked a few feet away. It's just, it's, it's insane. It's nuts. So I'm poking along like that. And I'm like, God, I'm going to scrape these cars. And I'm holding, I had a bench seat in the car and I'm holding on to the wind, the steering wheel. And I lean over in the bench seat as far as I can, trying to look out the side window, see if I can see these parked cars and see if I can see the entrance to the parking lot. While I'm leaned over like that. Now imagine this, the rain is coming down that hard. That's the visibility. Now it's gone. Doesn't slack off. Doesn't ease up. It's gone. There's complete visibility in front, behind, around. There's not even a mist hitting my windshield. I reach up and turn the wipers off. I'm like, what in God's name? The rain just, just, it's gone. It didn't stop. It's just gone. And as the, as I'm looking down the road, the people in the left lane coming our way are starting to swerve and almost hit the cars in our lane. And people are honking. People are yelling. People are rolling down their windows, pointing up the sky. People are jumping out of their car and pointing up at the sky. And I'm like, what in God's name? And I look where they're pointing and I've made it far enough to be in, going into the entrance to the Sears parking lot. And I could see the rear of the Sears building and over the rear of the Sears building, about maybe 30 feet um, above the roof, there was this metal circular UFO pie plate, <laughs> inverted pie plate shaped UFO, about 30 to 50 feet in diameter, just hovering over the rear of the Sears building <laughs> there in broad daylight and no smoke, no flames, no sound, no noise, just hovering there over the building. And that's what everybody was jumping out and pointing at and yelling about and honking. And Jimmy, I couldn't believe my eyes. I, I literally did a cartoon eye rub <laughs> and then look back up and there it is. And I'm like, oh my God. So I grabbed my door handle. I'm going to get out and get a better look. And the UFO just just barely, barely, barely perceptibly moved toward us. Just just barely. You could just barely see it move. And the low clouds came in from behind it, rushed over it and covered it up. And the second the UFO was covered up, the rain was instantly back again in full force like it was before. Didn't start again. It was just instantly there like it was before. So that was my first UFO experience. And I was like, okay, got to change denominations because... I saw it in broad daylight up close and personal with a bunch of witnesses. And there was a guy in front of me and, and uh, I said, okay, he was turning into, I could see him turn into the, the Sears parking lot. And I'm like, I don't care if I hit this guy, my insurance will cover it. I, I still can't believe my eyes. I'm going to, I'm going to talk to this guy. And so he parks, I park. We're not even in any spaces. We just, okay, we're parked. He jumps out. I jump out and the rain is coming down so hard. It hurts. I'm shielding my eyes. I run in the store. He gets in the store ahead of me and I had a vestibule there where there was an airlock, but two more doors. You go into the store down to the basement to the left. So he's standing on this big floor mat there and he's just standing with his head down. I remember he wore glasses. I didn't. His glasses were all beaded with water and both of us were dripping water like we just came out of the shower and I walked around. I stood in front of him. He didn't recognize I was there for a while. And I said, excuse me. And he looked up and he looked at me like, oh, okay. And I said, did you see what I just saw? And he said, yeah, but I damn sure ain't going to tell nobody. <laughs> he sidestepped me and walked off through the store. And, you know, back then, you got to remember, I was 20 years old. So this was back, you know, the late 60s, early 70s, around in there. You just didn't talk about any kind of paranormal thing or UFO. You know, you were crazy. You were nuts. You'd lose your job. You know, what's wrong with you? That kind of thing. So you just didn't talk about those kind of things. So that was his reaction. So that was my first UFO experience. And I've had several since, and I've never climbed on the bandwagon of, I know who they are or what they are or why they're here because I don't. And, right. and nobody does. You know, I, I had a wonderful conversation with Kathleen Martin 
who uh, Kathleen Martin is one of the most respected, as you know, in the UFO field. And, and I asked her, I said, Kathleen, do you have any idea? She said, no, we don't know. We don't know why they're here. We don't know their purpose. We don't know what they're doing. So I refuse to add to the UFO garbage by speculating because I don't know. And uh, since then, I've, I've had several very frustrating encounters. Um, one where there was a direct communication, a, tel a telepathic communication with me that just, just blew my mind. And I can't understand. I was sitting out in my courtyard and a beautiful, clear night. I've been an outdoorsman, a sportsman my entire life. I've loved the night my entire life. So I've always sit out and I've watched the stars. And I see this glowing orange translucent orb coming through the sky. And I'm looking, watching this thing. It's going real slow and it's down low. And I said, my God, that's a UFO. And it gets around in front of me and it's poking along there. And I stood up and psychically and verbally, I said, if you can hear me, stop and back up slightly, reverse course. And the damn thing stopped, Jimmy, and it reversed course. And then it shot from where it was way down low. If you sit out at night and you look and you see where the, like the 757s and the 727, whatever, flying in the night sky at that height, it jumped up to that height in less than a split second. No sonic boom, no noise, no smoke, no flames, nothing, just boom, it's there. It hovered there a little bit. And then from there, it shot up into the stars and hovered there a little bit. And then it shot off into the universe. And each one of those jumps was less than a split second. And if you no don't catch it, it, yeah. it, it, this is this is what is so amazing about that, John, is so many, including myself, yeah. if you see something at the end of its little thing, it's it's a star. Yeah, you're all you know. That's what you're observing, and yeah. it, it, you know you move on. Right. You have to right. see the first part of the event right. to understand right. that. Oh, that. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and how many how many sightings end that way, and nobody notices because they yeah. just see a dot up in the they sky the and it's just yeah. start, right, 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 right. Yeah. Do you think that um, there is a a connection? Uh, to all of this, uh, the the paranormal, supernatural, ghost, entity, spirit side of things, yeah, um, and and UFOs and 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 ET and yeah. that it's it's all possibly I'm, I'm I don't have the yeah. answers, yeah, but that it it it's all the same phenomenon. We're just calling it different things. No, um, I think that the. Uh, it, it's obvious to me that the paranormal realm exists as a separate entity, if you will, and that the the UFO, UAP, ET phenomenon that exists as a separate entity. There are paranormal components, such as the weird cloud that I saw before the UFO, that appear to manifest uh, with UFO uh, sightings, UFO experiences. So there does seem to be a paranormal component to that. Now, well, okay. Well, well, well uh, I, I interrupted you again. That's okay. You, you got too much information. Let me suck this stuff out of you. Yeah. The uh, the the cloud with the orbs, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you hadn't have driven to Sears, yeah, you don't see that exactly, right? So now, right. So now, if you just experience the orb side of it, mm -hmm. you're seeing something spiritual. Right. I mean, not you personally, yeah. but, but anybody else observing it would see it that way. Right. And right. and how many times throughout history where indigenous cultures that are thousands of years ago that are seeing yeah. something like that right. are right. associating that with spirits or yeah. the afterlife? Exactly. Exactly. And uh, the one thing that makes the separation for me, Jimmy, is that in communicating with those on the other side, which include nature spirits, spirits of this world, spirits of the earth and things. There's a very, very interesting thing that they have told me. And like, you know, we have a lot of negative connotations associated with UFOs, abductions, cattle mutilations, so on and so forth. 
and there are not that many positive associations with UFO experiences. There are some, there are a few, but not that many compared to the negative experiences. And interestingly enough, as I begin to try and investigate this and make more sense out of this and get more communication from the other side about this, some of the nature spirits and other entities that I have talked to told me they're a little bit peeved and a little bit upset with the ETs and with some of the things that they do. So there is that separation between that spiritual realm, the paranormal realm and the ET realm that where it doesn't overlap, where it is two separate things. And sometimes it encroaches upon the spiritual realm in a way that they don't like what they're doing. Do you have the ability to consciously connect with, with ET? I have like you do I've, with spirits. I haven't. I've tried and I haven't, and I don't understand why I, I, I can't. I don't understand why I can't because I've been willing. I've reached out, uh, and I've, I've never gotten that communication. It, it, it's funny, isn't it? Where, uh, because I have, I've seen it happen. I've done it myself. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting how you can go out on, on a night and go, okay, let's go. And let's then go. all of a sudden, boom, right? Yep. That, yep. That's not, that's not coincidence. No, it's not coincidence. There is a communication there. They understand that we're communicating but that communication doesn't seem to go further and doesn't seem to go the way that we want it to or that we need it to. When I communicate with spirits, whatever type of spirits in the, in the paranormal realm, in the psychic realm, the spiritual realm, the other side, I can request specific things and I can ask specific things and I can get those things. I can get that needed information. I can get that input. I can get that guidance. I do that for my clients all the time. And they show me things that are relevant for my clients, for their lives. They give me accurate predictions for their future, so on and so forth. I cannot get that from the ETs, and I don't know why. Why do you think the world seems so ready uh, for contact now? Well, you know, Jesus, we put up with this crap forever, Jimmy. It's like people have experienced abductions. They've experienced sightings. They've experienced UFO contact. They know that our government has to know something and they're like, come on already. You know, I mean, the government did our little piddling nine page report years ago and said, yes, they're real. Yes, they're physical craft. They're not ours. They're not theirs. They're not whatever. So they acknowledge the reality of this and then they won't go further. And then um, some of the people in Congress, uh, Tim Burchett, who I'm sure you're aware of, um, said that the, uh, the classified um, the briefing that Congress got about the UFOs, you know, we got the nine page report and I believe Congress got something like, what was it? A 90 page report or something like that. That's and right. Burchett, Burchett and some others said it read like a science fiction novel. They said it was just, just incredible, just crazy. So look, here's the thing. Decades ago, decades ago, I watched a documentary on TV and they were interviewing some of our previous heads of the Central Intelligence Agency. And this one guy, one of the former heads of the CIA said, uh, in regards to the SR-71 Blackbird, young kids, Google it. It was our premier spy plane. It flew in subspace, it flew so high, and it flew at such speeds that nothing could, could catch it, intercept it, shoot it down, whatever. So the CIA head, uh, former CIA head said, okay, during the SR-71 Blackbird era, he said, if you went out on a golf course on a putting green and put a couple of golf balls with the logo sides up a couple of feet apart, and the SR-71 flew over in subspace at speed and took a photograph, when you developed the photograph, you could clearly read which golf ball was a Titleist and which one was a McGregor. And he said, that's decades old technology. Just imagine what we can do now. Now, this is decades ago that I saw this documentary. So one of the excuses that our government has always given us in regards to UFOs, we don't have the technology. We don't have the capability. We, we know that's BS. You know, there are credible people that have come forth and said, hey, we've got 4K high-res photos of these things 50 feet off the wings of our fighter aircraft. Okay. So we know the technology is there. We know the capability is there. The intelligence aspect has to be there for our government to tell us, nah, we don't know. Come on. You know, people have put up with this for so long 
and people are having these experiences. People are watching uh, the, the uh, Secret of Skinwalker Ranch on TV and seeing UFOs appear in the sky on film, seeing UFOs provoked, seeing portals open up, seeing things happen. These things are happening on an increasing basis now, thanks to shows like that. So people are aware of the existence of this reality. They're aware of the existence of UFOs. I imagine the majority of the population has had a UFO experience. And so people are frustrated. They're like, you know, come on, let's get this thing out in the open for good, ill, or whatever it is. Let's at least be honest about this. Let's open up. Let's acknowledge that it's real and tell us why they're here. Tell us what you know. Tell us what's going on. You know, they treat us like imbeciles. They treat us like kids and they control and manipulate this information. And we should have access to that information. We should know. And the argument is always, well, if this were to come about, there's two big arguments. It would lead to the destruction of our society and it would lead to the destruction of our technology. Well, number one, no, it's not. Because if the president were to come on TV tomorrow and say, my fellow Americans, UFOs are real. Here's what we know. This is why they're here. They're going to make a visible appearance, going to begin to land and interact with us, da 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 there's going to be some people that are going to panic. There's going to be some people that are going to say, yep, I knew it all along. There's going to be other people that are going to say, I'm ready for it. Bring it on. There's going to be some good old boys from West Texas loading up the shotguns, getting in the pickup beds, going, yeah, let's go get some aliens. We're going to basically act like we normally act. So it's not going to be the end of society. If you're religious, you're still going to be religious. If you're not religious, you're not, you're not going to switch. All of a sudden become religious. I always said the people that are religious are going to go surround the ships, and hold hands, and Jesus save the aliens, whatever. So that's the first aspect of it. The second thing is it's not going to destroy our technology because even if they introduce technology, it would take a long time to integrate that into our society and to replace what we already have. So everything would be a sequential process. It's not going to be this overnight, boom, everything's instantly changed. It would be a, sequ a sequential process. And it would be us getting to know them, them getting to know us, that exchange, that that inter, that interface occurring. And just like you meet somebody, you don't immediately take them into your confidence. You get to know them. You see if you can trust them. You see if you like them. There's that two-way street there. So it would be this long process. But we're way, way, way overdue for it. And I mean, it's so ridiculous not to acknowledge it and for our government to, to pretend like they don't know what's going on. They have to know what's going on. Well, what What's frustrating for me is the, the physicists and the scientists of the world and the rock star physicists and so forth right. that um, play the game of I'm smarter than you. Yeah. yeah you yeah. are stupid. Yes. Right. So they yes. play this game. Yep. And and what they don't understand is that and they don't get it because they've they've they're on this God trip, right? Exactly. Where they, they're just exactly. but but here's the deal. We know what an airplane looks like. Oh, we know what a helicopter looks like. We know absolutely. what a meteor looks like. We know or what a an blimp, or a blimp, or a, blimp, or a, bird, or, or, yeah. a, a yeah. bumblebee, right? Exactly. We we know that, and when we see something that doesn't fit any of that, yeah, we stop and ask questions. Do we jump to ET or UFOs? Well, you know what? Let's put that there. Yeah, let's let's discuss this where exactly. the physicists or, you know, the, whatever will go. Yeah. You don't know what you're seeing. Exactly. You don't understand. Exactly. Stop with that. Yeah. You need to go. OK. All right. Let's let's check There's this a out. Possibility. Let's check There's it out. You know, it's, like, it's like with the uh, with the amazing Randy. And for people that don't know Randy, the amazing Randy was a professional stage magician that became a debunker and his life's mission was to destroy a regular. Now I've met a regular and in spite of the controversy, a regular is a real deal. I can tell you that from meeting him, knowing him and Uri's provided some, uh, some blurbs for my books, bless his heart, <laughs> which I'm really grateful for. But uh, Randy went into the whole paranormal investigation scenario with his mind made up that there's nothing to any of it. And so Randy developed this million dollar prize 
And yeah. he would give, it was uh, verified, it was in the bank, it was blah, blah, blah. And he would give that to any psychic that could prove that they had psychic ability. So I'm watching a show and dang it, I can't remember the show. And it's so long ago, I recorded this thing off of TV on VHS tape and I can't find it. We've moved so many times. I don't know where it's at, but at any rate, uh, Randy had, uh, was showing these various psychics that attempted to get the prize and blah, blah, blah. And didn't. so this one guy, and I think it was a psychometry thing. I think Randy had this object or whatever for this guy to look at. So this, this guy was a psychic. And so, uh, Randy says this object came from a friend and it was really obscure. And if this guy gets anything at all, it would be a miracle. And so the psychic comes and lo and behold, he starts describing Randy's friend, telling that where the object came from and blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Now, Randy, by his own admission in this special, in this, this documentary, Randy, by his own admission, says this guy is batting a thousand. And they go on and the guy says, there's something about your friend's neck. And he says, it reminds me kind of like a clerical collar. He said, I don't think it's a clerical collar, but it kind of reminds me of that. Or maybe like a Nehru jacket. But there's, there's something about your friend's neck, like some collar or something there. And Randy says, nope, wrong. He said, my friend's not a priest and he doesn't wear Nehru jackets or whatever. So come to find out, Randy's friend has a proclivity for wearing turtlenecks. So there is a collar. There is something around the neck. But Randy says, nope, 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 not right. So Randy says, if one thing's wrong, everything's wrong, throws the baby out with the bathwater and on we go. So I was on, uh, on radio a lot in New York when we lived in New York. And this buddy of mine called me one day, I was, was on his show frequently and he called me and he said, uh, we were talking, we were just kind of shooting the breeze. And I went, oh man, I panicked. I said, are we on the air today? And he's like, no, 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 no. I just, I, okay. So he said, I was just calling you to tell you something real interesting. I said, okay, what? He said, guess who I'm going to have on the show? I said, well, I don't know who. Yeah, he goes, Randy. I said, the amazing Randy? Are you kidding me? He said, no, I'm going to have Randy on. He said, can you call in? Can you be there? I said, let me check my schedule. I was like, oh, my God. No. I said, there's no way in the world I can rearrange my schedule to be there. I'm sorry. I can't do it. I said, I'd love to, but, but I can't. He said, well, give me some questions for Randy. I said, okay. I said, ask him about that episode with that psychic that he said was batting a thousand. He said, okay. And I said, also ask him this. This is a question I ask everybody, every skeptic. I said, if you're honest in your deepest heart of hearts, haven't you had one experience in your life that you can't explain by rational means? So I said, ask him that. So he said, okay. So he called me back after Randy had been on the show. And he said, uh, I asked Randy about the psychic. And I said, look, you know, the, the guy's batting a thousand. You're admitting the guy's accurate. You're admitting the guy's right. And then you shoot him down over this one thing that he really didn't even really get wrong. And Randy said, well, this is all set up in advance. I decide what's right, what's wrong, what's correct, what's not. And if one thing's wrong, it's all wrong. I'm like, man, you, you can't win. You can't win. If one, I decided one thing's wrong. Therefore, it's all wrong, even the stuff that was right. So he's like, okay. So we ask him the next question. In your heart of hearts, if you're totally honest, haven't you ever had at least one experience in life you couldn't rationally explain? And he said, Randy answered this way. No, next question. <laughs> yeah, that you know, and, and James Randy. Now, look, he's not with us. Nope. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. The but I'm going to say this: there was a side to him. He was so soft spoken. He was uh, had a way of delivering. Uh, so he just sounded like he could be the final word in something. Exactly. It, a trusting, he had a trusting thing about yeah. him. Yeah, now, I like I like James Randy. Yeah. I did. Okay, so but that being said, he wasn't going to part with that money. Oh no, he no. he would. There was no way. I remember the. Now I'm saying this in in a very respectful sure. way. Sure. It started out as a $10,000 challenge, right? Yeah. Like back yeah. in the 60s or something. And right. it was a pretty famous thing that was laid out. And it was yeah. fun. 
Yeah. And and back then, uh, Yuri Geller and others um, that uh, the, the Soviets were doing their thing. We were doing ours. We had Stargate. Yeah. We had remote yeah. viewing. Yeah. Yuri Geller's coming over to, to, to San Francisco, Stanford University, and he's working yeah. with us. Uh, there was all, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Ingo Swan, right? Yeah. Yeah. There was so much of the psychic ability side of things that the world was fascinated with. Yeah. James Randi played his role in that. Okay, yeah. I get it. Yeah. The $10,000 challenge, we were all fascinated with that. But yeah. but 10,000 large in in the 60s was was all the money. That's yeah. big money. Yeah. James James was never going to part with that. Exactly. And I was I was okay with it. Let's let's let somebody <laughs> do something and right. and challenge James on the money. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. I was all into that. When that got up to the, I forget what they called it. They called it like the, the Randy gift or the Randy prize or something. Yeah. That thing got up to a million dollars. Yeah. I don't think James ever had a million dollars in escrow. He, he never had that kind of money. Yeah. Um, but it was fascinating to watch that go through, but there was no way. I don't care what happened. If a UFO landed in his backyard, right, right, right. we're not getting a million. <laughs> not say it in the kindest of ways, right? Yep, yep. But but watching the challenge go on and yep. and watching his frustration with it yep. uh, was was pretty cool. And and, yep. and James, yep. I, I say it in the kindest. <laughs> I, I really do, <laughs> but but it, here's the other here's the other part. You mentioned that CIA special, by the way. Um, th that was that documentary. I think it was the what what the Living Thirteen Directors or something like that uh, like of that. of the NSA and the CIA. The, right, uh, right. Amazing documentary. Yeah. But um, when we back up into the mid nineties. Things are taking off. Art Bell, coast to coast. We've got the right. TV shows and, and right. things. Things are taking off. And the government comes out with a report called Roswell Case Close. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And and the GAO, the General Accounting Office, they do so you had the state of New Mexico and their state senator or Congress uh, that that initiative. Then you had the GAO. Right. So the Air Force comes out with their report that was started with uh, New Mexico, and the General Accounting Office comes out with their report They're about a year apart. Right. Anyway, the Air Force report lied. Yeah. Now I remember I go, um, I'm at the company that I work for. I print out mm -hmm. at, at my company because I didn't want to use my printer at home and pay for it. <laughs> I, I print out the report. I go out to the parking lot. I'm sitting in my car and I'm reading it. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I know enough about the Roswell case mm -hmm. to catch the lie. Yeah. So I'm reading it, and you know, it's 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 Project Mogul. It's uh, parachute dummies that right, were right. misinterpreted. Yeah. Um, and and I'm sitting in my car, and I went, "Wait a minute, that was 1954. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Roswell crash was in 47." Right. This is a lie. Yeah. Now, unless you yeah. know what you're reading, John, exactly. Exactly. you don't catch it. Yeah. The rest of the public, the press and everything else, they're reading this. It's yeah. okay. It's all right. And and I remember driving home as fast as I could to get on the internet just to verify my dates and the way yeah. that I'm reading this. Yeah. But they are telling a lie. Yeah. And it it that that the, the conspiracy part of me just went through the roof. It's like yeah. this is this is the problem exactly right here. Exactly. This is the, the the public is being lied to. You're going to get caught yeah. in this yeah. lie in this official report. Where does the trust building start with the public if you're doing right. this? And that's right. the problem. 
And I got to tell you, talking about Roswell, back in uh, 1998, they had uh, Alien Encounter 98. And I went there to do readings. And Stanton Friedman was there lecturing. I got to see him. And uh, I was born in New Mexico, but had never lived there. And uh, so I, I went, I said, well, while I'm here, uh, you know, before I uh, start doing readings for the day, I got to go to the Roswell UFO Museum. I got to do the touristy thing, right? So I head downtown early one morning and uh, go to the Roswell UFO Museum. So it's not open yet. So I'm looking through the windows and waiting for it to open up. And I'm standing out on the sidewalk. And there's not many people. And this lady comes walking down the sidewalk and I look at her and as she gets close, she nods to me and smiles and I nod to her and smile. And, and she walks up and she stops and she goes, uh, are you waiting to, uh, to get in the museum? I said, yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm waiting for it to open. And she said, do you live here? And I said, no, I said, oddly enough, I was born in New Mexico, but I've never lived here. And I said, uh, so this, this is my first time in Roswell, my first time at the museum. And she goes, oh, what do you do? And I said, oh, God, here we go. And I said, well, I'm a psychic. I'm doing readings at Alien Encounter 98. And she looked at me and she goes, well, you'll believe me then. I said, oh, okay. I said, what, what do you have to tell me? She said, uh, my, uh, my brother and I, when we were young, we were out in the yard playing. And she said, we saw the UFO come over that crashed. And she said, we knew it wasn't a bird. We knew it wasn't a Superman. We knew it wasn't a plane. We knew it wasn't a blimp. We knew it wasn't a helicopter. It was a UFO. And she said, we saw it come over and the way it was moving through the air, even at that young age, we said, it's in trouble. Something's wrong with this thing. It's in trouble. And we saw it go over and crash. We saw the UFO and we saw the crash. And I was just gobsmacked. I was like, holy God, I said, I'm talking to a Roswell UFO crash eyewitness. And I said, have you ever like gone on any interview shows or, or you know, made this information available to the public or whatever? And she goes, no. And I said, why not? And she goes, well, when this happened, she said there were people that were from the government people from the military and people that we didn't know who the hell were. And they came house to house and they talked to us and they said, you've not seen this. You didn't see anything at all. And if you ever speak about this, you and your family's bones are going to be found out in the desert, quote unquote. And I was like, holy God. And she was like, yeah, she said there were, there were several of us threatened, several of us threatened with death. And, uh, and so on and so forth. And about that time, she snapped her head up and down the street a couple of times. She said, I've said too much. I've got to go. I'm sorry. Nice to meet you. And she walked off real fast. So even those many years later, that fear was still there. And um, I was watching uh, a, uh, an interview the other night that Peter Robbins did with Kathleen Martin and some other people. And in the chat, I asked him, I said, have any of you ever had a men in black experience or been threatened by the government, the military, or whatever. And all of them had, all of them had had men in black experiences. All of them had been threatened and told to shut up, not to talk about things and so on and so forth. So this is the environment that's out there for whatever reason for UFO witnesses. And, you know, like you say, even though it's past time, we know it's there, we know it's real. Um, there's still people undergoing these things and undergoing these threats and undergoing these difficulties and coming forward and expressing what they know. So it's a, uh, it, it's a minefield to navigate. Yeah, it is. It is. And uh, real quick, I'm going to pop this up for everybody because the chat is talking about this person. Okay. So I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this right now. Everybody that's me and Jimmy Bain in my living room. <laughs> and there's a Jimmy. Uh, there's a young skinny, uh, that's Jimmy and Jimmy. There's a young skinny Jimmy <laughs> church. There's my, there's my flame guitar sitting there. there anyway, that's, a, that's my living room. And there he is, Jimmy Bain. Uh, we yeah. were talking about Grand Bonnet earlier, yeah. the band Rainbow. He was the bass player in that there band also go. with, of course, Dio. So I thought that everybody would get excited by that. But here's the thing with, with that comment, though. Yeah. If we back up, everybody's seen the movie Oppenheimer. 
Right. Okay. Right. If you go back to New Mexico in 1947 and where everybody in that state, let alone the country, yeah, is keeping secrets. Exactly. That that will <laughs> like yeah. the yeah. real secrets. Yep. So if the government rolls along and the military rolls up on you and says, keep your mouth shut, you know what you did? You kept your mouth shut. You kept your mouth shut. Yeah. That's that's it. And, yeah. and you got to think about that atmosphere. Now yeah. we can roll this into the UFO issue. It doesn't matter. Right. Right. The biggest, I mean, it was it was all going down in New Mexico. Yep, that was a yep. everything. Everybody watch Oppenheimer. Yeah, there's yep. A, there's a TV series. Um, it's uh, I think it's about ten years old now. It's called Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. It's two seasons long. Right. About the uh, Los Alamos and and, yep. and stuff. And go watch that TV series. You want to yep. talk about? You couldn't talk to your best friend about the sandwich you had that day for lunch or your wife. <laughs> You That's couldn't tell your family at all. Yeah. At all. At yeah. all. That was that was a, the way of life for everybody. Yeah. And so when people come up, John, that's the fascinating part about what you just said. What people? How can you keep a secret? How could they keep a lid? What are you talking about? Yeah. Do you yeah. have any idea? What well, not it only was that, like? but there were. I had a a dear dear friend of mine. I write about him in one of my books. And he uh, actually worked. He was an Air Force major. He was in fighter pilot training. He worked for the NSA and, and a lot of these things. And he took his patriotic oath and his non-disclosure agreement and his top secret security clearance so, uh, took it to heart so much that he just, there were things he would not tell me. And I knew he had information. I knew he knew things. And he was like, John, I just, I, he said, I'm sorry. I just, I'm not going to tell you. I can't, I'm not going to tell you. And so people take that secrecy agreement and take, people take that oath of non-disclosure so, so seriously uh, that he never told his spouse. He never told his friends. I was one of his best friends. He never told me. So you have that aspect of it. Then you have the threat aspect of it. You know, if you talk, your your family's bones are going to be found out in the desert. So you have those two aspects to deal with. But can you keep secrets? Oh, absolutely. You can keep secrets. Our government keeps secrets very, very well. Yeah. The, and the, the problem that the public has now with this now, it's one thing to keep secrets about the atomic bomb or weapons. And, and, and I get that. And I respect right. that. I live in, in my neighborhood, I've got Edwards air force base. I've got Lockheed skunk works right. down the street. Right. I see stuff. I don't talk about it. Yeah. Right. It, yeah. I have to respect what's going on. Now, if I see a black triangle fly over my house, mm -hmm. uh, I'm probably going public with that. I'm going to talk about it. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> but, but you have to respect that, that side of it. But here's yeah, the yeah. problem though. Yeah. When it comes to ET. Yeah. And extraterrestrial life. Yep. Now we're talking about nature. Yes. We're not talking about national government. Security, right? No, no. We're not talking about we, national security. We're not talking about something that's in the it's our, control of the government. This is out there. That's a, it's our right to know that. It's our right to know. It's our right you do know. not have the right to keep nature from us. Exactly. Exactly. You don't. You don't. Yeah. You don't. And that's, that's right. I think that's the difference today where the public is like, well, you know, uh, no. No, yeah. you, you don't have you the right to do that. You don't own space. You don't own the you don't, you don't you don't don't. UFOs. It's you like, don't. give it up, man. That, 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 I think that's where we are. And, and we're, we're smarter. Yep. We're, we're, we've come a long ways. You we're know, 5,000 yeah, 5, years ago, yeah. and you see you're the leader of the village, and you see a flying saucer, and it comes yeah. down, and whatever. And, and the village doesn't understand the universe and stars and planets. Mm -hmm. So you are going to use words like, God or angels or right. spirits. Right. You, that's the only way you can communicate that through. Today, it's not that kind of party. 
Exactly. We understand exactly. what the we universe understand. is. Yeah, we understand. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. Hey, John, uh, the new book, now you're you're suggesting a publication date of 2024. What's yes, the deal? This year, the, the new book, uh, the first two books, uh, Writing with Ghost Angels and the Spirits of the Dead and The Knock in the Attic, those are all my true personal paranormal experiences, what I learned from them, what I teach others. They're written in a very entertaining way. Uh, 20 Ways to Increase Your Psychic Abilities. That's exactly what it says it is, and that's going to teach you safe, practical ways to increase your psychic abilities and live a better life. The fourth book is finished. That's The Crying Tree and the Magic Rock. That goes back to more true uh, paranormal experiences. And then I'm writing on my fifth book, which will come out uh, early next year, which is The Cansack Ghost, which is more paranormal experiences. And then I've had people bugging me forever. It's like, John, are you ever going to write a novel with paranormal overtones? So, yes. I have started a crime fiction novel with paranormal overtones. I've got uh, beta reader feedback on that, and they tell me they're enthralled with it. So down the road, that'll come out. So lots in the works. Have you seen, uh, or or already off of the network, but we're still live on mine, okay? We, yeah. we blew past that. That's there the way go. it goes. We're <laughs> having a great conversation. Is um, Have you seen The Octopus Murders? I haven't. No, I haven't. Okay. It's on Netflix. It's a four part documentary and uh, it's, it, it's four hours, right? One hour each. Um, just go and watch it. Yeah. The, now the, the name, the title of it, well, it's completely a hundred percent accurate, but it also mm -hmm. sounds like it's horror and gory and gore. It's right. no, right. yeah, it's murders, but it's not right. the killing of octopuses. Number one, number two, <laughs> Um, if you ever have wondered about how dots can get connected, mm -hmm. right? Well, you can just go and watch this. Yeah. And it, it 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 from the from the front from front street, right at the beginning, yeah. you already know that you are going to binge all four back to back. You know, the, there's no way <laughs> that that's so no, but, no but, question. Yeah. Yeah. Go, go and watch that. And, yeah. uh, I, I did a post about it over the weekend and, and watching everybody's reactions to it. It's one of those things where yet the world is just not what it seems. It's yeah. It, yeah. we all know that and understand it. Exactly. Go and watch. Go and watch it, and and if you haven't seen it yet, go and do it. Um, John, the next time you're on the show, we're going to talk about that side of things too, as well. Like Man, that. all the best, and uh, right, keep the rubber uh, side down. Keep the rubber side down. Brother. This is great. Thank you, Jimmy. You're the best, John. Thank you, brother. Hey, love you, man. Love you back, John Russell. John's links are below. Um, all of his books are there. Both of his websites are below. You can get his stuff. Go and check it out. And he's easy to chase down on Facebook and social media, too, as well. Thank you so much. That was a perfect way to start the week here on Fade to Black. I want to remind everybody what is going on tomorrow night. I've got Hugh Newman here. Wednesday night. Dr. Heather Lynn, and then Thursday night, Brigitte Barclay is with us. We've got an amazing week coming up here on Fade to Black. Thank you to everybody. And it's pretty cool that we have the chat room now over on the website. Become a fade or not right now, and you can. It's members only. Hang out in the chat room, and the chat room is live 24 hours a day. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jonicide. You had a busy night tonight, didn't you? All right. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJC, KJCR with the Game Changer Network. And this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2024 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black of the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Hugh Newman, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.